Hey, what's good self-direct investors? I hope you're all doing great and I want to welcome you back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Jordan. I'm the mind behind Make More Capital and today we're coming at you with the midweek update in the world of cannabis. Now, before we jump in, if you enjoy this video or you learn something, please just leave a like on it as it really helps out my channel. And then of course, if you want to learn how to take advantage of this generational investment opportunity, subscribe below so that you don't miss any future videos, but then there's plenty of content for you to go back, rewatch, and educate yourself with. I've tried to put all the news and facts in one place so that you can watch episodes over time to learn about the evolution of the industry, identify top companies that you keep seeing pop up, and take advantage whenever you're ready. Well, we're going to start with this big breaking news as of this morning. As Cresco Labs announces, we are thrilled to announce we have entered into a definitive agreement to acquire Columbia Care for roughly $2 billion or $2.1 billion. I haven't been able to look through it all as I just wanted to get through this video, but I do plan to do uh, a video of Cresco Labs earnings and Columbia Care earnings on Friday. So I'll come up with a Friday video to do that just to get into more detail, but a transformational partnership marrying the number one wholesaler of branded cannabis products with one of the strongest retail footprints. Now do keep in mind this is the intention to acquire. Obviously this requires the deal to be approved over time um, but nonetheless this is big news as apparently Cresco Labs buying Columbia Care would be the biggest cannabis company based on quarterly revenue surpassing even Curly for 347 million in revenue. Now I'm not exactly sure what pro forma True Leaf and Harvest combined would be doing in this full year 2022. But nonetheless, this just makes another big MSO to compete with the other big two. And so onto this news from Arizona Mirror, as cannabis sales drop in the first month of 2022. The stream of money raining down from cannabis sales abated slightly in the first month of 2022 in Arizona, with recreational and medical sales dropping to a combined 115 million. While Arizona Dispensary Association Director Sam Richards said record business in December may have more to do with the drop than sluggish sales. And I would definitely second that, as obviously we saw December being a strong month in many of the newly launched adult use markets. It's not so much a dip as December was a big spike, he said. It was a new and novel thing during the holidays. On the adult use side, sales hit the 63 million mark in October 2021 and increased to 69.4 million by December 24th. And a breakdown of what this brings in for the state. Of that total, about 4.5 million went to the state's general fund, 725,000 to education. I imagine parents in that state love to see that. 979,000 went to county revenue sharing and 604,000 to cities, highlighting the benefits of ending cannabis prohibition for the residents of Arizona. And despite the bit of a drop, I have no doubt that demand will continue to be strong in this state. As we move over to this one from MJ Biz Daily, as Arkansas posts 21.1 million in February medical cannabis sales, and that brings year to date medical cannabis sales in the state to nearly 41.7 million. The Arkansas Department of Finance and Administration, DFA, reported after more than 20 million in sales re were recorded in January. After after launching their medical program in January. So there's more information down here if you want to pause to read, but good job Arkansas making progress there. Well, I did want to touch on this one from Michigan, as cannabis prices likely to keep falling in Niles, Buchanan, and other Michigan towns. As we do walk through some of the growing pains we will see in unlimited license markets. While consumers have become accustomed to paying more for everything from gasoline to groceries over the past year, the cost for most cannabis-related products in Michigan has steadily been declining. And it's not like demand for cannabis is declining, obviously not, which is good for us. In fact, sales have been steadily increasing as new customers are drawn to the state's dispensaries, which have been adding a wider assortment of products. Now, for some context though, according to Michigan Cannabis Regulatory Agency, the price for an ounce of cannabis has dropped about 40% from 252 an ounce in January 2021 to 152 an ounce in January this year. Now, they don't mention Croptober, which we've learned from many of the MSOs is a real issue, as illegal cannabis growers in California typically grow over the summer into the fall, and then they harvest from fall into the winter and ship that stuff across the country and sell it for much much cheaper than obviously the illegal outlets would. And so I just wonder how much of a role that plays. Obviously, opening more stores and increasing the competition certainly plays a role in driving the price down too, but I do wonder if Croptober has an effect on that. And if from February to September, we might see the prices bounce back. So just wanted to share that, but and barring any unforeseen problems, there is little chance that prices will reverse course anytime soon as more growth facilities, processors, and dispensaries are opening each month across the state. And so I do think that is why wholesale is a great approach in the state as opposed to trying to operate multiple dispensaries. But nonetheless, we'll just have to wait and see how this year plays out to see whether prices do increase from February to September, see if Croptober does play a bigger role um, than obviously just the expansion and the competitive nature of the state. But a little bit more that I just wanted to get down to to share with you as well. Um, and without limits on the amount of cannabis that's produced, and again, this is exclusive to states that are unlimited licenses. Not all states are like this. So while Michigan, we are seeing the prices fall. Thankfully, there are 49 other states and markets for MSOs to work with over time. There's no surprise that prices in Michigan have been coming down and will likely continue to fall, Kilmer said. And this is Bo Kilmer, uh, a chairman of the Rand Drug Policy Research 
center in California. But it's also unlikely that the oversupply issue will be solved even if the federal government eventually decriminalizes cannabis, allowing it to potentially be shipped to adjoining states. And that obviously would involve interstate commerce, which isn't a reality yet. But I did find this take that he adds interesting. As people complain about the federal prohibition, but it's what's keeping them in business, Kilmer said. If legalization on a national level would allow big liquor, tobacco, and even Amazon to get into the business, Kilmer said, large companies would be the ones driving the market and they'd be looking to approve efficiency. And that would obviously entail, as we see industries over time monopolize, because over time all of the wealth gets concentrated into the few, that's the 80-20 principle, but all of the nation's cannabis could be grown at a couple of dozen industrial farms across the country, Kilmer said, and we don't want that. We want it to take as long as possible to get to that point, and that doesn't include the possibility of imports from other countries where cannabis could be grown and processed more cheaply, and I don't think this is going to be a reality too soon, because obviously as the U.S. has outsourced everything over the last 20 years, and that's given other countries a huge advantage, if anything, America would want to keep production domestic and absolutely dominate. But in the end, the businesses that survive might be the operators who have built a strong following in much the same way microbreweries have proliferated with multinational companies controlling much of the beer sold in the country. And I think the best way for companies to do that is to focus on brand. On to this one from Santa Fe, New Mexico, as New Mexico gets ready for recreational cannabis sales, which are set to launch on April 1st. As a state agency tasked with overseeing New Mexico's new market for legal cannabis sales is ready for the industry to launch April 1, its top official said, and the burgeoning cannabis retail business for adults 21 and over is no joke as hundreds of businesses are preparing for the day by setting up shops and stocking up on supplies. There are likely to be banners and balloons. So very exciting for New Mexico. I do hope this goes well for you on April 1st. And so with that, I wanted to share this from Champs Z. So thank you Champs for sharing this. A bit of info on New Mexico as recreational sales start April 1st, 2022. Apparently the medical cannabis patients uh, totals 131,931, while New Mexico has a population of 2.1 million and averages about 37.5 tourists annually. So just a bit more information if you want to learn about New Mexico, you can obviously pause to read. This is a bit more info on the qualifying conditions for medical cannabis. Um, same. And a further breakdown of medical cannabis patients in the state. And so some safe news from The Hill. Thank you, The Hill, for sharing what I was covering last week as cannabis industry goes all in on banking push before midterm. So it is good to see this sort of awareness in the mainstream outlets as they do cover that many, more than 20 CEOs of the cannabis industry were meeting with Congress last week in a blitz to try and get some incremental reform done. And the main takeaway is cannabis companies say they report those reforms that the CAOA wants to try and get done and they want to right the past wrongs. But they stress that an all-encompassing decriminalization bill would not receive the 60 votes it needs to get through the evenly divided Senate. So that is where we sit as we move into April and we anticipate the, the launch of New Jersey coming up and then Chuck Schumer introducing his CAOA, which will be dead on arrival. And then so hopefully he can use some of the remaining pieces left over to get safe plus some sort of social equity. I just want to cover that the Dales report is also mentioning the same thing that the Hill is reporting as cannabis businesses strengthen push for banking without restrictions. So good to see this awareness out there. But main thing that they say is cannab as cannabis industry heads believe that there is enough support from the Republicans to pass the Safe Banking Act in the Senate today. However, if the bill were delayed for vote until after the midterm elections, the potential shift to the right side of the aisle might spell bad news. And you best believe the CEOs made Chuck Schumer aware of that fact, especially if he wants to see full-scale legalization. Because if they lose the House and the Senate, which they likely will at this point, especially if they do nothing, then the Republicans might end up passing safe because they're much more business-friendly, but full-scale legalization is likely out the window. So in short, the clock is ticking for the passage of the Safe Banking Act, and the especially because the longer the Democrats wait, the more blood they have on their hands. As we lose another one too soon. Jordan Brown, 29 years old, was shot and killed during a robbery at a cannabis shop last Saturday simply because cannabis dispensaries still have to operate in cash because Chuck Schumer chooses to work for big pharmaceutical companies who pay him to delay the passage of the Safe Banking Act as opposed to working for the American people who voted for him. So it's a damn shame and more reason why Safe needs to be passed sooner than later. So just wanted to share this from William Jonathan who shares this snippet. Looks like the vote in the Senate for banking is on Thursday, March 24th. And from my understanding, this begins the conference process to finalize the America Competes Act. And while there is a chance SAFE will not make it into the final version of the America Competes Act, much like it didn't make it into the final version of the NDAA, I think regardless, we got to thank Rep Ed Perlmutter for getting it in there, spreading the awareness on SAFE, and actually giving us a shot this time around as well. And so while it's wise for us to plan for the worst, let's hope to be pleasantly surprised. And so a bit more snippets on SAFE as Pablo at Cantor with a note after meeting with Rep Perlmutter. So thanks, Todd, for
for sharing this. He gives his two cents as there is room to become more constructive, stating that with expected support of more than 60 votes in the Senate for safe right now, it would just take Majority Leader Schumer calling a vote to ensure the passage. But he does add that we believe a recent massive and well-organized lobbying effort by various groups may be increasing the pressure on Congress to act now and pass safe. So thanks for sharing that one, Todd. But on to this one from Height on Safe Banking. So thanks, Todd, for sharing this one. They're a bit more... Uh, or a bit less bullish and more bearish on the industry overall, saying that bottom line, our odds are less than 20% that Safe Banking Act is enacted into law in the 117th Congress. We expect the Senate to take up the America Competes Act, strip out the House passed legislative text, and replace it with the Senate's USICA bill. This action would remove safe banking from the legislation. So while both are a possibility, we don't know what's going to happen. So don't take this as exact advice. It's just speculation from investment firms. We really just have to wait and see what's going to happen. But did want to share this one from Todd as well. From 8 Capital on U.S. cannabis saying leading MSOs currently trade at a 2.7x next 12 month sales and 8x next 12 month EBITDA lowest level since March 2020 COVID lows. And so you can pause to read uh, more on the snippet or you can grab the link below if you can't see this full bit down here. But on that note, I just wanted to share uh, what MMG Wealth shared because I also do find this interesting. So thank you MMG Wealth for sharing this. I want to see something interesting. Comparing a high growth software company known as Snowflake Inc. with Cureleaf, one of the fastest growing US MSOs and one of the fastest growing emerging markets in the US. And so this was posted on Sunday. So this likely reflects the share prices as of Friday close, which represents $222.85 for Snowflake and $6.74 for Cureleaf. But let's take a look at a few other things. Total revenue uh, last 12 months, $1.22 billion for Snowflake and $1.21 billion for Cureleaf. Interesting. Compounded annual growth rate for the last 12 months, 105.95% versus 93.04%. Quite high for both of these companies. Well, if we look at their enterprise divided by sales last 12 months, 52x, so they're trading at a, at a market cap valuation of 52x their enterprise value divided by sales for the last 12 months versus Cureleaf trading at a 4.4x their enterprise value divided by sales for the last 12 months. That is wild. And then their profit divided by gross profit last 12 months, we have 89.7x versus 6.9x for Cureleaf, which means either Snowflake and Cureleaf are fairly valued right now at these prices, despite very similar total revenues and compounded annual growth rates for the last 12 months, or it tells us that Snowflake is severely overvalued or fairly valued, and that Cureleaf is significantly undervalued based on the very similar total revenue and compounded annual growth rates for the last 12 months. Because if we look at Snowflake's share price right now, $223.50 representing a market cap of 67 billion US dollars versus Cureleaf. Well, today Cureleaf is trading at $6.60, representing a total market cap or valuation of $5.2 billion. And so that is why I call this a generational investment opportunity. When they have very similar Similar total revenue and compounded annual growth rate, yet one is valued at $67 billion and the other one's valued at $5 billion simply because one industry cannot uplist onto major exchanges because they still deal with cannabis, while the other one can list on major exchanges because it's a high tech software company and not a cannabis company. And so, if Cureleaf's enterprise value divided by sales were to be the exact same as Snow's and jump up to 52x, they were to be valued and say they could uplist on major exchanges like any other company, that would involve Cureleaf's share price rising by 13 times what it's at right now. Don't don't you find that interesting? I do. Let me know in the comments what you think. And so lastly, onto this one from the Dales Report, or not lastly, we've got a few more, but from the Dales Report after a Q4 2021 buying blitz that saw Jason G. Wild purchase several million dollars worth of TerraSend shares on behalf of JWAM funds, the wild man is back. And while modest for now, it will be interesting to see whether the start of a new buying spree has been initiated, but regardless, we do love to see insiders buying in the space, which gives us investors a bit more confidence, while Cresco Lab celebrates a milestone opening of their 50th operating retail store as they announced on the 21st, the grand opening of a new Sunnyside dispensary in Lady Lake, Florida. Well, the new store marks a milestone in Cresco's nationwide retail expansion, bringing the company's total retail footprint to 50 locations across seven states and 16 total stores in the state of Florida. So despite or even without the Columbia Care announcement this morning, they do continue to expand. So good to see that out of Cresco. And so on to some state news as Cannabis Business Times shares that Cannabis Senator introduces legislation to bar municipalities from prohibiting medical cannabis dispensaries within their jurisdictions. And so I think this is going to be very helpful for the industry in California as they try to fight the illicit market. A Senate Bill 1186 would require all cities and counties to allow licensed medical cannabis dispensaries, licensed medical cannabis deliveries, or both, the news outlet reported. The legislation allows cities to choose which form of medical businesses they allow, but they must allow at least one type. And so SB 
1186 aims to prevent Proposition 215, California's Compassionate Use Act that the voters approved in 1996 to legalize medical cannabis from being undermined by local jurisdictions that have blocked access to medical cannabis by banning both dispensaries and delivery services. And so SB 1186 does not take local control out, or does not take local control of adult use cannabis businesses away from California's municipalities, according to the news outlet, but it prevents them from prohibiting all types of medical cannabis retail. So I will cover this as it develops in California, but good to see this as this might be one way to force more openings or at least more acceptance of the industry and help fight the illicit market there. We've got some news from Marijuana Moment out of Maryland as lawmakers approve millions in funding to implement cannabis legalization if reform is enacted. So great news is they're preparing to have this on the ballot and they are expecting a yes from voters as key Maryland House Committee advanced a Senate approved budget last week, adding new amendments that would allocate tens of millions of dollars in funding to implement cannabis legalization with the expectation that reform will ultimately be enacted this year. The House Appropriations Committee cleared the amendment legislation on Friday. It would provide about $52 million to support the implementation of cannabis legalization, facilitate expungements for prior cannabis convictions, and fund a disparity study to better understand the barriers to entering the cannabis market. So good job, Maryland, as you get as you prepare to legalize next year. And then on to this one from New Hampshire. As Marijuana Moment reports, New Hampshire lawmakers approve state-run cannabis legalization bill with amendments, sending it back to the House floor. So a bit of progress out of New Hampshire. As a House committee approved an amended version of a bill to create a state-run cannabis market for adult consumers, sending it to the full House for a second floor vote. And if the chamber passes it again as amended, it will be transmitted to the Senate and then hopefully become a reality sooner than later. And so I will provide updates as this is interesting. New Hampshire is the first state to go with a state run model. And it will be interesting to see how that conflicts with the federal laws and the extra 280E taxes that they likely won't want to have to pay. So over to Belize quickly as the Senate revises the cannabis regime in Belize, legalizing for adult use. So good job, Belize, as the Senate has approved amendments to the misuse of drugs. 2021 initially intended to legalize cannabis in Belize for adult use. And so just to add, the bill passes with amendments and will now be handed over to the Governor General for assent. The new one, the Cannabis and Industrial Hemp Control and Licensing Bill, is before the relevant House Committee. And so I don't know exactly when this would go into effect, but good job, Belize, as you move out of the old prohibitionist mindset and start to uh, you know accept the good things that this plant does bring. So just wanted to share this as a petition, as some are making an effort to try and secure Brittany Griner's swift and safe return to the U.S. And while sadly, I do think that this is out of our hands at this point, there is a petition here at this link, so grab it below if you want to try and help out. Obviously, if we can get enough signatures, it might make a difference. But Brittany, you kind of screwed up by bringing something legal in the U.S. to another country where it is illegal. But I hope this helps and I hope we can get you back and this can be constructive for the plant overall somehow, some way. And so lastly, just wanted to share this informative video from Dan the Man at the Chart Guys providing a cannabis chart check-in as of March 19, 2022. But Dan has spent a lot more cycles in this industry than I have. And obviously, I've learned a lot of lessons, especially over this past year, and that I could have sold everything in February and then waited until now to start buying, but there's no way I could have known that. And so while Dan's a trader and I'm a long-term investor, I've been watching a lot of his videos to improve my technical understanding and just to try and bridge the gap and bring, you know, both strategies into a more well-rounded investing approach going forward. But nonetheless, just wanted to share what he has to say uh, and some great wisdom that he does share in this last bit of his video. So it's a long road ahead. It'll happen eventually. It's just patiently waiting as far as I'm concerned. So again, I still have the mindset where I'm going to make a bunch of money in the U.S. cannabis sector. I we have will. no doubt of that. I know the headlines and the FOMO are coming. I just don't know when. It could be years. And I will patiently wait because I plan on making multiple years worth of gains when that opportunity shapes up. Me too. You too. And I know a lot of people that maybe have not gone through this, these many cycles are saying, oh, yeah, right, it's never going to shift because it feels like forever that we've been weak. But again, I, I mean... Over the last 11 years, the amount of times that I've gone through these cycles, I sat through an 85% drop in Bitcoin and the crypto space that then turned around to all-time highs. And I did not give up on that sector. Like I said, it, it took a 250% bull move for me to say, okay, I'm paying attention now. But then it was years worth of gains on the follow-through that resulted from that. So there will be massive opportunity, and the key in this market environment is preserving capital until the timing is right. Hardest thing to do. I know that's tricky and hard to do, and I know a lot of people have a bunch of bags in this sector right now. So we learn from those lessons and apply them to future opportunities to ensure we don't make the same mistakes 
But that is how I'm approaching the sector. So- well said, Dan, and thank you for that reminder. But that is it for today's episode, folks. I want to thank you so much for tuning in, and I really hope you got some value out of it. What did you think of the stories mentioned? Let me know in the comments if you have any questions or suggestions, and I'd be happy to address them. But besides that, if you enjoyed this video and you learned something, please just leave a like on it. Subscribe below if you don't want to miss any future videos, and I will catch you on Friday for a special recap of Cresco and Columbia Cares earnings. And then I'll be back on Sunday for this week in cannabis news. Have a great week, everybody.